Hello again, Tim's back here with another uh, video lecture for business ethics, and uh, tonight we're starting our first topic in, uh, or our first reading in the topic of affirmative action with this uh, article from Hedinger, um, and we're going to finish up uh, the topic with Pojman next week, so it's a little awkward kind of they're bounced on two different weeks here now because of our uh, lecture from earlier this week on on writing for papers. I've been talking with some of you about paper topic ideas. I'd love to talk with more of you about it. Um, in many cases, I've told people I've like given some feedback and then said probably something like like let's keep talking about this. And I hope we do. Um, I wanted to clarify something for everybody. Um, when you make a topic proposal for me, this happens every time I have papers with students, um, probably my initial, um, uh, especially with like an early stages idea, I'll probably have some kind of initial reaction of like a word of warning or something that might be problematic about the topic. And I wanted to clarify that um, those are not uh, reasons to not do a topic. Like if I think a topic is not going to work, I'll let you know a um, very explicitly about that, about like why I think it might not work. Um, but in most cases, when I'm like, well, there's this to worry about, there's that to worry about, I mean, that's going to happen for almost any topic proposal that's made. Um, there's always uh, particular sort of dangers with it about ways it could maybe not go the direction that um, we need it to go for the purposes of the parameters of the assignment and things like that. So I don't want, um, I didn't, I didn't want it to be discouraging if I'm like, look out for this, watch out for this, um, because almost any topic will have some kind of danger to it. So, I uh, wanted to clarify that, um, and uh, I, the, the topics that people have been proposing so far have, on the whole, uh, sounded really cool to me, and I'm excited to see where they, where they go. And I, again, as a reminder about the kind of, let's keep talking about it kind of thing, um, please loop me in at any stage of the process of you working on this. I'm, I'm happy to help out at all stages. Um, if you need help brainstorming objections or arguments or other things to include in the paper that might be morally relevant, I think that'd be great. Um, and actually, I think there, there's going to be a few things about Hedinger's paper that actually, uh, and Pojman for that matter, that I think might be... Um, good lessons to pick up for the paper that you're working on too. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in my last um, lecture when we were talking about the paper. Um, I know I talked about it with my on-campus class, but um, there are, oh shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh man, it's been a long day. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Um, Oh shoot! <laughs> oh, no. oh, I hope it comes back to me. Paper topics. I'm working on paper topics. Oh, that one. That one just fell out of my brain. Um, my apologies. Hungmei asks, uh, "Should we send the topic in advance for your comments?" Yes. So that's what I was definitely inviting um, in the last lecture. I'm not making an official assignment that you need to clear your topic with me, but that comes strongly recommended. Um, I, I wouldn't want you to be doing a bunch of work on something and then find out that this is not going to work or there's some like may, maybe major tweak that has to happen to make it work. Um, so please, please, please talk to me about it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I am excited to see what you're what you're going to do with these papers and how they're going to go. And, and I'm happy to be a part of that process um, the whole way through. Um, so please don't be shy about getting in contact with me. It's very easy in the online format to just kind of like do your work and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, please please be in contact with me as much as you care to. But at the very least, with an initial topic idea for sure. Yeah. Um, anyone in the chat have other questions about this whole paper assignment thing? Anything left over from the last lecture? Yeah, picking a topic is hard. Um, yeah, and and doing that sooner rather than later is going to be really, really important, I think. I think I said this in the lecture earlier this week. Um, picking a topic is probably the hardest thing about writing a philosophy paper. 
um, and you'll want to get direction on or some kind of some kind of loose vision at the very least of what you want to do so that you can be kind of like processing it and letting letting it kind of work in the background of your mind um, that that will produce a lot of good results if you wait to do the whole thing last minute it's going to be real painful um, and don't don't um, if procrastination happens uh, and sometimes I'm familiar with how that can discourage coming and talking to me <laughs> when it's like getting more last minute. But I really, I, I hope that uh, no sort of feelings of shame or something would keep you from being able to gain access to me as a resource that can help you out. Uh, I won't, I won't judge. I, I don't play blame games about it. But I, I would definitely strongly encourage for your own sake with this project to be thinking about it earlier rather than later, talking to me about it earlier rather than later. Um, if you wanted to write, uh, Leeling is wondering about writing on affirmative action. Um, I think that it's a fantastic topic. I think I also mentioned this earlier this week that it would be okay to do a topic that is a part of the class and to do one that's not a part of the class. Um, it might be very tempting to choose something in the class because it's already something you sort of thought about a little bit. And um, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, I do um the the bigger danger if you do something that's already been talked about in the class is that your paper might just be rehashing the same arguments that we've already been talking about if you did the topic that's coming from the class then i'd want you to be thinking about having some bigger ambitions with it like how to dive deeper or to explore it or take the discussion in directions that it hasn't already gone um, these philosophers have not exhausted everything there is to say about these topics by any stretch of the imagination, especially with affirmative action. Um, so I think uh, I think that could be a good topic, but you'll just want to kind of push the envelope on it a little bit. Take that debate to the next stage um, if you can. That that'd be something I would want. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, cool. Anything else you're wondering about, chat? Okay, looks like not. Um, all right, so getting into affirmative action, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, this paper from Hedinger is loaded, very, very loaded. Uh, lots of arguments in here. Um, and I think I think Hedinger, sort of think about it still in the context of your own papers, Hedinger is a very good example of um, how to have an organized philosophy paper when you're dealing with a lot of arguments. So both of those points that I talked about um, in the last lecture are in spades here with Hedinger. He's cramming as many arguments in here as he can. He wants to address as many different things from his opponent, so he's a really good example of engaging with the opponent too. And when you've got so many different thoughts and arguments and ideas and values being thrown around, being able to organize them and present them in kind of a clear sequence and not confusing them with each other, that's really important. My guess is as you start brainstorming your paper, it'll be easy to sort of feel overwhelmed by all of it. And I would say just let that be while you're brainstorming. But then when you're getting closer to actually writing the paper, start to try to organize the different thoughts and the ones that kind of go together in this discussion over here, maybe versus some other discussion that's happening um, independently or in parallel to it. Um, Hedinger is really good for that. Um, and... Um, yeah, the way in which Hedinger engages with his opponent is is really, really solid, too. Very, very good example. Oh, that was the idea. <laughs> I knew it was going to come back to me if I just waited long enough. Um, so I think I definitely talked about this with my other class, but I'm not sure with you. Um, oh, no, I'm losing it again. Oh, no. Oh, I can't believe this. <laughs> oh, I need to get some more coffee or something. Oh, okay. No, I remembered. I remembered. Oh my gosh, my stupid brain. Okay. Sometimes students ask me for paper examples from other students in the past for this assignment. And I say no. I, you, I, you, I have always said no when students have asked for that. And there's a reason for it. Um, one reason is that um, sometimes, uh, you know, how you find your own philosophical voice might be different for somebody else. So like writing a philosophy paper in a kind of cookie cutter sort of way or just by mimicking 
the structure of what another student has done is um, is not always going to serve you the best. Um, it, it the philosophy is not really a paint by numbers kind of thing. It's not a turning the crank sort of activity. It's it's got to always be a little creative in my opinion, um, because every issue and every different discussion and controversy has its own kind of unique shape and its own uh, specific concerns and they you there isn't a one size fits all for how to crack philosophical puzzles um, so I, I don't I don't usually give that um, to students um, you're you're gonna kinda have to work on it and find your own voice through the process uh, yourself but you also have lots of really good examples to work off of for what you're trying to aim at doing and those are all the papers that we're reading now um, all these contemporary philosophers are trying really hard to be clear uh, and organized. Uh, maybe you didn't quite feel that way about Kant, Mill, and Aristotle. <laughs> that would be understandable. Um, but contemporary philosophers put clarity at the uh, top of the sort of intellectual virtues as a, as a real top priority for their writing when, they're, when we're talking about complicated things. And I, I think all of these philosophers that we're reading are the right role models. Um, it is... I, like I said in the lecture earlier this week, I'm not expecting that um, all of you are going to write papers that are, or any of you are going to write papers that could just be like published in a philosophy journal like next month or something. Um, that that isn't what my expect. That's not where my expectations are at. But I do want you to shoot for that kind of thing as much as you can to just be involved in the process of this with that as kind of the goal and to see how far you can get with it. See um, how close to that ideal can you get and I've had um, many students in the past in this particular class through the accounting program who came into the quarter and they were like I don't think I can do this or I haven't <laughs> I have a couple uh, specific memories in mind a couple students were like I haven't written a paper in 15 years at all like a research paper in 15 years I'm like pretty nervous about this assignment um, but just going through the process talking with them a lot about what their vision is and and how to execute on that vision they've turned into some pretty impressive stuff to me before stuff that I would really not have expected out of someone taking a philosophy class for the first time and and this being their first crack at it um, so I really think that that's possible if you if you just involve yourself in the process you might be surprised at what you're capable of creating and if you've got any worries or concerns about it I'm here to help you with that too and to get you what you need to get you where you want to go um, so so I think that's that's all the things I wanted to say, kind of following up on the on the uh, paper lecture from last time, and let's let's get into uh, affirmative action here. Um, I've always I've gone back and forth a few times on whether to do Hedinger first or Pogeman first, and it's always been a hard decision. And I I've kind of settled on uh, Hedinger first, but there there are some things from the Pogeman reading that are good at, in terms of introductions to the topic. And probably the biggest thing that Pogeman does, and I mentioned this in my weekend update email, but one of the big things that he does early on in the paper is sort of remind all of us, his readers, the audience, that in this debate around affirmative action, there is intense disagreement and sometimes some pretty loaded uh, feelings about it. I, I mentioned in the weekend update email that when I teach this uh, on campus, every time I've taught this class, this has been the topic that really we get the like, whoa, like people people get heated or, or kind of excited or enthusiastic about the topic uh, and very intensely disagree with each other about it. And Pogeman reminds us of this and reminds us that on matters of deep moral importance where the stakes are high, you can have people who are sincere, informed, intelligent, and thoughtful who disagree about what's right and wrong uh, in really fundamental ways and we don't have to observe that and say something fatalistic in response like we won't ever be able to get the answer or there isn't an answer or something like that but it, it's just to respect how uh, difficult of a debate this one can be how, how tricky it can be to resolve it um, that there are a lot of different morally relevant features that are sort of in going around um, that make it uh, difficult to resolve. And I think that Pogeman intends this observation to be one that um, inspires us to be patient with our opponents uh, and to not demonize them, which is something he complains about. In other words, 
when it when the stakes are so high and we have such strong opinions and perspectives about these different conceptions of social justice and how be best to execute on making a just society um we might have a tendency to think that people who don't see it our way are either uninformed like ignorant unintelligent insincere or unreflective and that's just not true and i i think that that kind of sentiment feels even more poignant to me right now uh given where we're at in a, as a country um and the sort of style and rhetoric of public discourse especially on politics and matters of ethics um right now but i, I think so i think that's a good reminder and a good thing to keep in mind here um people can be concerned about social justice deeply and have a deep commitment to it and have very different ideas about what is the vision of a just society and what is the right and proper ethical just way of achieving that uh ideal or at least making some progress toward it so um i think that's important i think that's very important um another thing that is sort of on the level here of rhetoric uh some of you might be wondering about uh these two different terms that we use affirmative action and reverse discrimination and you might have wondered why Hedinger chose uh, in many places in the article to prefer the language of reverse discrimination to affirmative action. And I, I think this is actually kind of a cool point about what's going on here. Um, just look at those words. Affirmative action. Sounds positive, right? Affirmative. Active. Active. Kind of more important than passive or something. Like the, it, this has more of a connotation of, of something good. And reverse discrimination it evokes very negative sorts of feelings, right? Discrimination already we associate with being wrong. But reverse the whole idea of reverse discrimination feels like uh, it insinuates a kind of uh, hypocrisy, right? Or like a, a double standard or kind of doing the same thing that you're objecting to, right? Kind of back at the, the very thing that you reject. Um, so they're kind of loaded. Both of those terms for the thing that we're talking about here, the phenomenon that we're talking about, um, are sort of rhetorically loaded. Now, Hedinger is in favor of affirmative action. And in the paper, he's trying to defend not just affirmative action, but a very strong version of affirmative action. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Um, if, if those of you uh, who are in the chat, you're not um, seeing on my screen the uh, lecture notes, I highly recommend pulling them up for this lecture because there's so much going on and I will be kind of moving through the lecture uh, in, a, in a linear fashion to hit these arguments one at a time. I mean, I've got those uh, listed at the, at the beginning of the lecture here. Um, but because, even though he's in support of affirmative action, he chooses to use the label of reverse discrimination. And why does he do that? I think it's to try to prevent readers from being convinced or being maybe influenced like biased toward his view just based on the kind of rhetoric that's being used to talk about it so uh you maybe have heard of the the um, phenomenon of spin doctoring which is uh, something politicians do all the time like to speak in in rhetorically subtle ways to make a bad thing sound good or a good thing sound bad and it's a tactic that's been a part of propaganda from the very beginning of any serious work in propaganda that uh, has ever been attempted. Um, so that's something, if you're a sincere truth seeker, you'd want to avoid. Uh, the purpose of arguing is not just to persuade, but to try to get at the truth. And a sincere truth seeker would want their audience to agree with them because their arguments are effective, not because they did this kind of rhetorical sleight of hand or something. Uh, to make it sound good. They want to prove that it actually is good. So think about Hedinger choosing the language of reverse discrimination. It's kind of like taking a rhetorical handicap. If he can still convince you based on his arguments, then that's even more effective. Uh, he's accomplished a lot more than if he's convincing only through some kind of rhetorical sleight of hand. So I think that's kind of a cool thing to talk about. But really, when we use the term reverse discrimination or affirmative action, we're talking about the same thing here. All right, so the next thing is to clarify these two different notions of affirmative action. Um, and by the way, this might be helpful. I always like to do this at the start of a new topic. Um, let's set context here. So what are we talking about in this debate around affirmative action? Um, let's go back for a second. So the fiduciary duty debate was about managers 
and the sorts of things that should be influencing managerial decisions about how to use company resources. And so thinking about the responsibilities of managers, but also in the process, the responsibilities of businesses, which the managers are then the agents of, right? Or at least they wield that power. So if the business needs to do something, then the manager would need to make sure that that happens, right? So we're really focused on managers and sort of the big picture respons ethical responsibilities of businesses. In the whistleblowing topic, now we were talking about a very specific sort of context of, it's widened a little bit, we're not just talking about managers anymore, we're talking about any employee, but within this really specific context of uh, an employee who becomes aware that the company that they work for is engaged in some kind of wrongdoing. So what to do about that was the whistleblowing question. With affirmative action, I'll, I'll probably stick to affirmative action. I might use reverse discrimination a few times because Hedinger uses it, but I, I like to stick to affirmative action to try to have some consistency here in the language. Poseman will use affirmative action. Um, when we're talking about affirmative action, we're talking about the kind of setting and context of hiring decisions. So whoever is maybe HR or managers, whoever is sort of tasked with uh, interview interviewing applicants or reviewing applications for employment and making decisions about who gets hired and who doesn't. And affirmative action is recommending a kind of policy or procedure that would be a part of that process of hiring. The weak version here, the weaker version of affirmative action, is sort of saying that when you've got applicants who have sort of uh, equal qualifications, they're both kind of equally competitive for that job position based on qualifications. And oh, uh, my other class is wondering about this, so maybe you're wondering about this too. Uh, when we're talking about qualifications here, we're not just talking about education and things like that or certifications, but anything that employers normally think about when they're thinking who would be best for this job. So it could be just straight up experience um, or other work that they've done or uh, letters of recommendation or something like anything like that that uh, would count as some sort of evidence for that they're going to be able to do the job in the best way. That's all we mean. Uh, so qualifications is pretty pretty loose here. Okay. So the weak for form of affirmative action is saying when two applicants or whatever many applicants you've got here, but let's keep it simple with two. If they have sort of equal qualifications, well, uh, affirmative action will say as a tipping point sort of hire the person who comes now, Hedinger uses the language, a minority candidate. I think that language is probably not as exact as we want it to be. Um, the big idea here is the person who would come from a disenfranchised demographic. That's my favorite language for it, and not just because it sounds kind of technical and clinical or maybe PC or something, but that, that seems like a very precise label to put to what we're talking about here. Because affirmative action in the big picture has as its goal social justice conceived of as a kind of equality. Okay, so we want, uh, uh, this is a conception of uh, social justice premised on egalitarianism, which goes, at least in our country, America, that's a pretty deep value for Americans. Um, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, we really should be people, but um, we have equal deservingness of happiness, um, et cetera, et cetera, freedom, all that kind of stuff. Now, it's true that our country also has a legacy of slavery, and that cuts against the core values of the Constitution and of the Founding Fathers, even though they were also slave owners, too. They're, they could be, they are very well hypocrites <laughs> in many ways. I think that's very fair to say. But the values that they also have are not um, tarnished at all by the fact that they did not live them out perfectly. And those ideals and values have been inspirational um, all throughout our history, even when we've been attempting to do things more progressive. Um, the civil rights movement of the 20th century was, I think, deeply informed by these uh, traditional American values. And it made it all the more poignant to um, Americans who were fighting for their civil rights. That's like, come on here. This is, I, I read the Constitution. What, what's going on? Why is this? Why do we not have this kind of equality? Why is there systemic injustice and uh, an unequal treatment happening in our society? We should do something about that. That's a problem. 
inequalities, um, not across the board, but certain types of inequalities. Because the argument I'm very familiar with people making is um, there's no way people can always be equal. You can't make people equal. They're born in different ways. And that's fair. That's a fair point. But in terms of how society operates, society has choices to make about how to distribute the benefits and burdens of that social system, the system of cooperation. We're going to talk a lot about that theoretical ideal uh, or that theoretical idea uh, later on this quarter when we do the social and economic justice unit like directly. But that's definitely in the background here. And society um, can decide how it's going to be responsive to natural inequalities. And to compound those things would be wrong um, in many cases. Certainly on grounds of discrimination based on race, discrimination based on sex. Uh, those are the two big ones that Hedinger talks about. We could very easily add to that discrimination based on gender, uh, or sexual orientation, uh, religion, um, all these sorts of things. Um, so, and, and even certain types of ethnic identifications that are not linked with uh, racial identification. But there, there are a lot of different demographics that have in the history of our society been um, not as equal as other demographics. They haven't been given the same opportunities by society, and they've been they've uh, been shouldering more of the burdens. So how society distributes opportunities and burdens, the benefits and burdens of social cooperation, have not fallen in an equal or fair or just sort of way. And affirmative action is a attempt to try to solve those problems of inequality. Um, the way that Hedinger is kind of presenting this is he's not saying he's, he's going to be defending affirmative action, but he's not thinking affirmative action is like some silver bullet that solves all of these issues of inequality and the ways in which our society fails to live up to its ideal of egalitarianism. Um, but he does think that he actually says right at the end of the paper, he thinks it's a necessary step, but he's also just trying to defend one of the tools that he thinks can have a big impact on this. So he doesn't think affirmative action is going to solve all the problems, but he thinks it's a pretty powerful measure. It's a, it's a big tool that we've got in the toolbox for trying to uh, help address these issues of systemic injustice. Um, so that's where Hedinger's coming from in trying to defend affirmative action. That's some of the logic behind it. It's got this kind of social justice mission. And there's a few different ways to understand that mission. And uh, this will kind of come out as we start looking through some of the arguments, but maybe as an early warning here, um, the two main types of arguments that, that get made in favor of affirmative action, I think are usefully categorized in sort of forward looking or backwards looking. You can sort of think about um, the distribution of opportunities, jobs are opportunities, and they're a part of the jobs exist because of social cooperation. So these can be talked about as the social benefits, right? And not having opportunities would be kind of like a burden. You'll see Hedinger talk about that too. Um, so how those things getting are getting distributed might be sort of cast in the moral mold of uh, reparations. Some kind of like trying to make up for past injustices kind of thing. Um, a very famous example of this is how Germany still makes payments to Israel and other Jewish organizations and communities um, as reparations for the Holocaust. Um, I don't know when those are scheduled to stop. They may have stopped recently. I think I remember reading something about that. But for many, many years uh, after World War II, um, Germany was paying these reparations. They try to. They're like, of course, the money can't make up for the kind of evil that the Nazi regime perpetrated. But this was like some way of responding to that um, and respecting what had happened uh, in, in just some kind of small way. It's still significant, but um, certainly is not something that can like make it better or something. But doing something would be better than nothing. And there are some people who would think about affirmative action on those grounds. Pojman's going to talk about that kind of defense of it, and he's going to present some objections to it. But Hedinger's not doing that. Hedinger is going to try to put his eggs in the basket of this kind of forward-looking argument that he's he's aimed at how do we create an equal future 
how can we create a fair society, an equal opportunity society in the future? How do we set that up to happen? And he thinks affirmative action is going to help with that and help in a very powerful way. And so much so that he defends not just the weaker version of affirmative action, where um, choosing in favor of a candidate who comes from one of these disenfranchised demographics is sort of like the tipping point when they're sort of equal on qualifications. But Hedinger wants to endorse the view that it would be right for companies to hire less qualified applicants that come from those disenfranchised demographics for the sake of this social justice project. And that's where things get really controversial. And Hedinger's not shying away from the controversy. He's like, oh, it would be easier for me to argue for the weaker version, but I'm not going to do that because I think the stronger version is right and it's just. And so let's look at all of the ways, and there are many ways, that people think that um, this stronger version of affirmative action is not just something we don't need to do, but that is something that it would be unjust to do. Okay. Now, I want to be very, very clear on something. People who are opposed to affirmative action are not just like racists or bigots or something like that. That's not the most charitable opponent here. The most charitable opponent is someone who believes in social justice, but is just worried that affirmative action is actually doing something unjust to try to address an issue of injustice. So it'd be like um, trying to solve one moral problem by creating another. And that's what a lot of these arguments are going to look like. Okay, so this isn't Hedinger talking to the bigots, this is, or people who don't believe that social justice is something we should care about. He's addressing himself to much more reasonable opponents, people who are like, no, yeah, this moral stuff matters. I mean, the fact that we live in an unequal society is a problem. It needs to be addressed, but not this way. This way would be bad. Um, in a kind of impromptu way earlier today when I was giving this lecture to my other class, um, I brought up Star Trek. And I know Star Trek is not uh, a, a frame of reference for everyone in the class. Uh, some of you, when I uh, was doing, uh, wearing the Star Trek hat or something, have made some comments to me being like, Star Trek, yeah. But I know it's not for everybody. But I think this metaphor might still work. It might still fly and be a little bit helpful here. Um, so forgive me for the little Star Trek tangent. Um, but I'm a big fan of Star Trek. Love all the series. Um, some of them I like more than others. But uh, let's talk original series. So the 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 kind of the first Star Trek series it was done in the Cold War. Um, did a lot of progressive things. Uh, and ha the the episodes are always almost always had some kind of like big moral drama happening. Like Star Trek wanted to get philosophical. It wanted to talk about issues of ethics and justice and all that kind of stuff. But very often the episodes were pretty black and white, that it was like something happens in the story where there's this moral threat and the characters, the main characters, uh, present the proper response to the moral evil and address it in the morally ideal way. And it's always like, this is, this is morally wrong, this is morally right, here's the answer. Kind of like a Sunday school story or, or something like that. Um, really n not very messy. Uh, uh, well, sometimes still pretty weighty because the moral matters they wanted to discuss were pretty serious. Um, and in, in some episodes really, really still ring to me today. They, I think they resonate with contemporary issues still, even though it was, gosh, over 50 years ago now. The 50th anniversary was just last year. But then the, the, the second series, um, The Next Generation, took a little different way uh approach to writing episodes and engaging in this kind of moral philosophy drama and what they did more often than not was to present in the story like here's a moral dilemma that it'd be like oh yeah that that needs to be dealt with that's a problem here's the right value here's the right response but oh wait a second here's this other thing over here that's also a moral problem and this is the right response to that but then oh, oh these two moral issues are colliding in the same set of circumstances or something um, so it's like you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like this thing morally matters, obviously, and this thing morally matters, obviously, but in this situation, they conflict. Which one to prioritize? That's kind of getting closer to what this topic of affirmative action is kind of all about. That it's not, um, there are a lot of black and white issues going on, like the black and whiteness of how, uh, like the systematic oppression of people just based on things like 
sex, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, religion, etc., uh, is wrong. But when it comes to solving it, and what are the things that would be a proper response to try to make some progress on that, we see familiar values clashing. And Hedinger's going to try to weed out some of that stuff. And he's going to be splitting up his concerns uh, from his opponents into kind of two categories. On the one hand, he's going to look at what he calls spurious objections. Those are ones we'll talk about first. And those are ones that he thinks like they don't really have a leg to stand on. They don't hold any water when it comes to the affirmative action case. Some of the values that they talk about are real values, but they like don't apply in this situation or the, the way in which uh, the analysis is being made um, is just not sustainable. That under investigation, they look like good reasons. These would be like prima facie arguments. They look good, but under analysis, they actually were like, oh yeah, there, there's nothing there. There's nothing, there isn't a substantial point here. There isn't a legitimate point to be made. Um, not that people who make these arguments are doing something insincere or any of that stuff, but just that it might look like a compelling reason and then turn out under analysis when we really start looking at it and what it says, it kind of ends up amounting to nothing. And Henger thinks that a lot of the objections to affirmative action look like that. But he also thinks that there are some objections that are much more legitimate, that really do have uh, a moral leg to stand on and pose a much more serious threat to the moral legitimacy of affirmative action policies. And those are going to be the last two objections that we'll look at at the very end. Um, but those are ones that would be kind of in the category of what I was calling pro-tanto arguments. Um, when in one of my previous lectures I was talking about this distinction in prima facie and pro tanto. With a pro tanto argument, you've got a consideration that actually has weight to it. Like this is um, something that actually has some grounds of being compelling. But maybe it's still not a effective objection. It's not a fatal objection because the arguments in favor of affirmative action can outweigh it. And that's how Hedinger is going to try to respond to those last two objections uh, or categories of objections. Um, he wants to say, yep, that's a good point. I share with you the concern, but I don't think that that concern is powerful enough or a high enough of a priority to uh, conclude that affirmative action would be wrong and unjust and we shouldn't do it. He thinks that it can be vindicated despite those things that are problematic about it, that it's still the better option to take. Okay, so that's a lot of framing. Um, I've been talking for a while about the paper, but I think all that setup is kind of important. Um, those of you in the chat, um, how's it going so far? Uh, do you have any questions that have, have sort of popped up? Not hearing anything. Oh, oh, here we go. All good? Okay. Cool. Yeah, you're welcome. Looks like some people are typing. I want to see what they have to say. Oh, sure. Yeah, we. I'd be happy to talk to you about your paper topic later. Yeah. Okay, so far so good. Wonderful. I feel like I'm I'm always throwing down a lot in this lecture, and um, a lot of big ideas uh, are in the sort of the background here. And there's so many arguments to talk about that I I always get a little nervous about um, talking like a mile a minute. Um, Yes, I am. I'm. I'm talking about Hedinger. We won't be talking about Pojman just yet. We'll do Pojman next week. Um, so a kind of comparison between the two is not in the cards for tonight. Um, but as we do Pojman, I'll be doing callbacks to Hedinger. Um, so we'll do that. But tonight it's it's Hedinger. So yeah, if I'm if I'm talking too fast or something, let me know. Uh, is language barrier considered as discrimination? Um, that's a good question. So, hmm. 
we'll kind of get into this with the first argument, but the the target of injustice that uh, sort of sets up the need for something maybe like affirmative action is um, that people have been sort of unfairly treated out of uh, really some really deep things like prejudice, um, stereotypes about people that are just false, um, people weren't given fair opportunities and things like that. Um, something like a language barrier could be, by some people, thought of as just roped into qualifications. Um, whether a company needs to kind of, uh, it, for the sake of equality and fairness, make extra opportunities to integrate people that speak different languages is a pretty hotly contested topic itself. Um, for some people, I, I'd say as a matter of practice, not to endorse it ethically, but as a matter of practice, many companies take that kind of attitude. That this is almost like um, being, being able to speak the language in America, English, uh, would be, and in some jobs it might be something different, but might be considered a qualification for the job. Sometimes there can be exceptions to this. For example, uh, we were, a student brought up an example earlier today in my other class about um, hiring a doctor for a hospital that serves a mostly Hispanic population. To hire someone who is Hispanic and can speak Spanish is probably a pretty important uh, piece of qualification for doing that job. In other contexts, if you know almost all the employees speak English, then being able to integrate with that might be considered part of the qualifications for that job. A lot of people think about it that way. But um, a language barrier would be very different from like straight up racism, right? That people come from a certain country um, or have a certain ethnic background that you wouldn't want to hire them for that. That would be a kind of traditional discrimination that is clearly inappropriate. Um, but we're going to kind of see here as we start looking at the arguments that we got to think carefully about the word discrimination itself. Um, affirmative action is a kind of discrimination, hence the, the name reverse discrimination. All we really mean by discrimination is that there is something we're discriminating about. So when, a, uh, when someone who's hiring people for a job uh, looks at the school the, or the past education or how many years the person has experience in the field uh, or something like that. I mean, they're discriminating based on those variables. We just don't think that's inappropriate discrimination. Um, failing to hire someone because they're a woman, that's a problem. If that's your only reason, um, that would be maybe a problematic form of discrimination. Well, affirmative action seems to be discriminating based on exactly those variables that we say traditionally it would be inappropriate to use as a, a way of determining who to hire and who not to hire. So affirmative action, reverse discrimination, has something to answer for here. And that's going to be this first kind of objection, that reverse discrimination is morally equivalent to racism and sexism. Um, but again, we can also expand the... I mean, Hedinger and Pozeman both talk a lot about race and sex. But... Um, we can basically run the same model, the same program on anything, any sort of feature that would cause there to be this kind of disen, uh, social disenfranchisement, like a certain demographic that's disenfranchised. I think there's a possible case to be made for uh, language barriers as being an inappropriate form of discrimination. I think there could be a case to be made for that. But it'll definitely be a little different than than some of these other factors. Um, because there there isn't any good reason to treat race all by itself as or sex all by itself as something that bears on the qualifications for a job, except in very specific counterexamples, which we will get to. Um, but generally, that would be true. Um, and uh, a language barrier is not just a matter of like um, your ethnicity or your race or something like that but it can have a direct impact on the potential of your ability to do a job, depending on the context for that. Um, does that, what do you think about that, Hongne? Do you consider it discrimination? I, or I guess I should clarify an inappropriate or unethical kind of discrimination. Don't think so? No? For maybe the reasons I just described?
Hmm. That it, it could be seen as part of the qualifications for a job. Yeah. I'm hoping we get a little discussion going tonight because this, this topic it definitely invites it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I think that, that um, there's also a case to be made for that too. I, I don't have a very strong stance on it myself. Um, I have a strong stance on other things, <laughs> um, like the the general standards that we should use to make judgment calls about this, but um, I'm also a pretty big progressive on these things. Um, and and actually, if you want to know where my heart lies um, and where what flag I wave in my front yard, um, I'm pretty close to a Rawlsian form of a social contract theory. I think that that, and we'll th we're, we're going to study that directly later on in the in the quarter. Not because I like it, but the, it's impossible to talk about social justice in the 20 21st century without talking about John Rawls. He's had a very big influence on it, and his ideas are very innovative and, in my opinion, pretty compelling. Even if you disagree with him, he's got some pretty good arguments. Uh, that you have to tangle with. Um, and I think that sets the kind of right framework for how to approach any of these questions. And to boil it down to a real quick sentiment, I'd say the guiding light here is that if you've got people in a society, you need to design the rules of society, how society distribute the pattern on which it distributes benefits and burdens to people in that society in a way that can elicit a kind of universal buy-in that we're not forcing unfair rules onto people who those rules don't favor. <laughs> and that's the kind of inequality that affirmative action is trying to fight against. That this, <laughs> I kind of hate to use this phrase after uh, where we're at in history right now, but the system is rigged <laughs> and has been rigged for a long time in favor of certain demographics. And white males are pretty top of the list on that. Um, not exclusively, but they're a pretty prominent one, um, especially depending on how far back in history you want to go. Um, and uh, we want to unrig it in some way. And a good way to think about what would count as unrigging the system is finding some way, some form or pattern in which people could be like, yeah, I'll be a part of this system of cooperation because I'm not just being thrown under the bus by the rules that we've settled on for the sake of other people to be able to get more advantage. Um, I, I kind of relate it to, uh, imagine you were going to um, go in with a friend to split rent on an apartment and your friend gets the bedroom and you sleep in the closet, and but you're paying equal rent. Like, that's not, no one would agree to that arrangement um, unless they were like, I really like small confined spaces or something like that. Um, but that wouldn't be something that could elicit that universal buy-in. But that's the kind of thing that happens in our society all the time. So people who are um, who have that language barrier, that's their circumstances. And we would have to find a way to um, have things set up in a way where they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with this. I'm down with this system. Um, th I'm not just being exploited here. Um, what about the look for the person being a better looking person? Oh, like, uh, are you talking about beauty or attractiveness or something like that? Liling? I'm not hearing back. I think that's what that question is asking about. Um, we'll talk about that one too. That would probably go in this category down here of um, the charge that race and sex are morally arbitrary and irrelevant characteristics. I'm going to set this up by kind of framing it with what would it mean for, why would it be morally problematic to make hiring decisions based on arbitrary and irrelevant characteristics? Uh, attractiveness, physical attractiveness, could definitely be a part of that, um, depending on the job. Um, whether it could be roped in as part of qualifications, uh, maybe, maybe in certain contexts, very specific contexts, um, like maybe fashion models or something like that. Um, there could be some ethical problems around that. There's plenty of, of ethical debates around the concept of beauty and what role it plays in society and all that kind of stuff. There's definitely some big debates there. Um, but uh, 
if you're hiring, um, let's say a lawyer for a law firm, attractiveness mm, probably shouldn't happen. Or I mean, maybe I could see someone saying, well, that might contribute to their ability to argue effectively to a jury, right? Like people are more inclined to have a favorable opinion <clears throat> about the things that attractive people say. That's why um, people uh, attract, uh, try to uh, hire attractive people to be newscasters and stuff like that. Um, am I on the right track of what you were thinking, Leiling? There, there's a lot of professional jobs in which attractiveness would be totally irrelevant to the qualifications for doing the job well. And if someone made a hiring decision based on that, that could be charged as being a morally arbitrary and irrelevant characteristic and it'd be inappropriate. inappropriate. Oh, the for the attractiveness of the lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we live in a society that's pretty obsessed with beauty. And personally, I think the standards of beauty that society has are kind of ridiculous um, and potentially unethical uh, for in terms of what we do with it and how we distribute burdens and benefits of social cooperation on a basis like that. But we'll actually get into some of that stuff as we go. I, I'm eager to make that happen. Um, we're already at 50 minutes into this lecture and we haven't talked about a single objection yet. So let's, let's move it along. Okay. So here's the first um, objection that, uh, that Hedinger is going to face off against to try to defend and vindicate strong affirmative action as something not unjust, but something that would be morally appropriate to do. So the first, the first objection, and this is definitely one of the most common ones I hear um, in, in just my uh, conversations with people and the internet and stuff like that. Affirmative action is doing the same evil as traditional discrimination, like racism and sexism. Um, which we've uh, been suffering for a very long part of our history. And we're trying to wake up from that and um, do something different, um, something much more just. But reverse discrimination is executing the same evil this objection charges. And Henger's reply is that it isn't the same. Making uh, So the, let, well, let's, let's try to use some charity to get inside the opponent's head here. So if in the past, let's just use this as an example. If in the past, women were turned away um, from work uh, if they wanted to apply uh, um, employers would say no just because they were women making that hiring decision based on their sex then if we don't hire males because we're trying to get a more women in the workplace then we're doing the same thing we're making a hiring decision based on someone's sex that's wrong um, the uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII of that act, uh, is when um, we had laws on the books that said hiring based on sex and race is illegal. It cannot be done. And some people have held up the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as a legal precedent for saying affirmative action policies can't be done because they are making a decision, they are discriminating about who to hire, based on those variables. So that's the very thing that we said we didn't want to do anymore. This is regressive, not progressive, to have affirmative action policies. So the charge goes. Okay. Um, and by the way, this might be an important note. We're really going to be looking at this from an ethical perspective, not a legal perspective. Affirmative action has a very interesting legal past in the United States. Um, and I would say, on, uh, from studying it and taking a look at all the court decisions, it's kind of ambiguous. The Supreme Court has not been as definitive on this thing as we might hope, uh, which is unfortunately how that's kind of how the Supreme Court tends to roll. They uh, make rulings about very specific things and they kind of avoid making flat generalized uh, judgments about things. Pardon me. Um, but uh, there was a, just two years ago, 19 uh, or 2016, um, the Supreme Court uh, had a ruling that was much more in favor of affirmative action, coming out much stronger, sort of setting more precedent for it being legal. But previous to that, we had a ruling from the Supreme Court in 2003 that was more on the unfavorable side. So there's been some ambiguity about that. For our purposes in this discussion, we're going to pretend like the law thing is just not even on the table. Whether it's legal or illegal doesn't matter. The question would be, 
would it be ethical for a business to do this? And I think another framing that's pretty important here, um, we are not worried about social responsibility right now. I told you that the fiduciary duty debate was going to be a part of all of these discussions. If you don't think businesses have social responsibilities, then of course you don't think that businesses should be using hiring policies that are trying to address social evils like inequality and injustice. Um, but if they do, if they do have social responsibilities, could they try to uh, exert that social responsibility or fulfill it through hiring policies of affirmative action? That's kind of the way that we're framing the debate here. And this objection says, no, they can't because they're actually contributing to the injustice that we're trying to target. There's something deeply hypocritical and contradictory about affirmative action according to this objection. Here's Hedinger's reply. It's not the same. They are totally different. Uh, reverse discrimination cannot be morally equated to traditional discrimination because the motives, intentions, and the consequences of the two forms of discrimination are totally unlike. Okay? So, and so the, those differences are what make for a moral difference, a way in which we would say traditional discrimination is unethical and immoral and unjust, and reverse discrimination is not unethical, immoral, and unjust that it actually is morally acceptable. So let's run this through. Um, traditional discrimination, like think Jim Crow laws and stuff like that, involved as pretty much a necessary and essential component, the contempt, loathing, and judgments of inferiority for um, these disenfranchised demographics, um, for oppressed people. Um, the uh, impropriety at the thought of elevated status for them, like it would be wrong for us to have a black president, for example. Um, that's what was involved in traditional discrimination. None of those um, motives and intentions are a part of reverse discrimination. Could you imagine someone who's in favor of affirmative action, who has contempt, loathing, judgments of inferiority for white males? Yeah, I can imagine someone like that. Honestly, I've never met a person like that. <laughs> I haven't. Um, I think they sort of get cooked up as a kind of urban legend sometimes. But I can imagine, man, there probably are a couple of them out there. But it would be wrong to evaluate affirmative action by just the, weir the weirdest extreme person who's out there who's a representative of the position. <clears throat> There's no reason why using affirmative action hiring policies require or have as an essential component contempt, loathing, judgments of inferiority, etc. Traditional discrimination, that was essential. So that's a pretty big asymmetry here. And on the point about consequences, traditional discrimination promoted stigmatization, stereotypes, and greater inequality of social and economic benefits. And none of those, Hedinger thinks, can be attributed to reverse discrimination. Pojman's going to argue a little bit that it does. We'll see that, so hang on to that for next week. Um, but I think especially on the level of uh, greater inequality of social and economic benefits, Hedinger's on pretty good ground here. The whole point of affirmative action is to set up a more equal future. So this really can be an equal opportunity. It is an equal opportunity right now. Why? Because of the legacy of those previous injustices. Not as a matter of like reparations or something like that. But it, it, kind of imagine this scenario. Let's say, um, uh, you know, a lot of times money gets handed down through successive generations, like parents give their money to their children. Well, imagine like a very long time ago, um, or let's just have, let's say your parents, <clears throat> your parents, let's say your grandparents, we'll make it, your, well, let's give it a little more distance. Let's say your grandparents do something, <clears throat> they run a business in a deeply unethical way, but it's not illegal at the time. And so they were perfectly within the law to do this and they made a bunch of money and then you receive it as a kind of inheritance. Um, the laws are changed now, so that's considered illegal. And, and for good reason, because it was unethical the whole time. It, it just wasn't the law that was playing along. So now we're like, okay, whew, okay, we solved one problem. We made that illegal. Great. No one's going to do that ever again. Let's say that works. <laughs> the law's punishments are harsh enough that it deters people from doing the same kind of unethical thing. You still receive all that benefit, right? All of, um, <clears throat> we don't even have to talk about it like you need to give it back or something like this is reparations, like it was stolen and so it needs to be returned. But just, you're at an advantage now. Uh, it's not an equal fight anymore. It's not an equal competition between you 
and the descendants, the children, uh, the grandchildren of the people who were abused by your grandparents, right? Um, that's the kind of situation that we're in. And that's why Henger thinks that affirmative action uh, is necessary to kind of like solve that so that we can get to a place of equal opportunity. And that is a consequence, he thinks, of reverse discrimination. So on, in terms of the consequences, these things can't be equated either. <clears throat> and then he makes this point. And I could talk about this a little bit more if people are curious about it. But um, if we think actions are defined morally, at least in part, by the intentions and motives behind them and the consequences that we, they have, then we can't compare by way of analogy the moral status of traditional and reverse discrimination. They're just not the same. You might notice here that in this claim by Hedinger, you see echoes of Kant and Mill. And this is very characteristic of applied ethicists, like people who work in the field of business ethics, that um, they're like, we don't have to decide all those big picture ethical theories. We've read Kant and Mill. They seem to identify moral values that we care about. So if we think we should evaluate the morality of actions based on consequences that contribute some sort of thing, or based on intentions, that's what Kant was saying, then no, either way you want it, you can't equate traditional discrimination and reverse discrimination. They're just not equal. Um, I, I think I'm going to move things along because of timing here, because we're already at an hour. Um, but um, there is a contemporary Kantian. Her name's, um, I think this is, yeah, I think this is Christine Kursgaard. She's a neo-Kantian uh, ethicist, and she wants to argue that we shouldn't think about, in, if we're trying to break up what's an action, like the, the concepts of different actions, we shouldn't define them in terms of just the physical or overt behavior, but that you need to work into a definition of an action, the behavior plus the intention behind it. Like this would be kind of like a contrast between um, if I... Uh, accidentally or inadvertently say something that hurts your feelings versus if I insulted you. Like an insult is a different action than an in a, a behavior that inadvertently causes someone's feelings to be hurt. An insult's like more directed, right? Like I'm intending to have your feelings hurt. And that's a different type of action. That's a different thing that I'm doing. The first case might be problematic, but maybe only as a kind of negligence on my part. The second case is morally problematic in a very different way because I'm like intentionally trying to hurt, hurt your feelings. So this is, a, I think, a pretty plausible view. Um, and that would definitely add more fuel to the fire for, for Hedinger's argument here. Now, he does take a little aside. So if, if we're saying in terms of motives, intentions, and consequences, these things are not morally equatable, then the opponent might still say, but oh, maybe, 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 maybe. Okay, so sure, fine, whatever. But isn't there, maybe there's something just intrinsically wrong with discrimination itself. Um, regardless of the consequences, motives, and intentions, maybe there's just something to discrimination all by itself in a vacuum that we would consider to be morally problematic. And Henger is like, as a general principle, this is, is totally implausible because there's way too many possible counterexamples. Um, I'm not going to rehearse them all here, but um, I especially like a couple of these. Um, the idea of, of studies that target certain demographics. So let's say we want to figure out like the effect of smoking on women. A male can't show up to the people running that study and being like, hey, I want to get paid for participating in this survey, but you're discriminating against me. And they'd be like, no, uh, the people that we need, like if we hire uh, any males to participate in the survey, that's not get the data we're looking for. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that would be a case of discriminating based on sex. Um, if you, uh, I like Peter Singer's ghetto play example. If, or I, I, I maybe update it, make it even more straightforward. Let's say I'm doing a play on Martin Luther King Jr. And when I'm thinking about casting Martin Luther King Jr., I'm not going to be like, anyone can apply for the role. If I wanted to kind of have this historical reenactment thing, I could get really artsy with it, right? And I could have like an Asian female who's transgendered like play the role of Martin Luther King Jr. Like I, we could do that, but that'd be an artistic choice and maybe that's not a part of my artistic vision. I want this to be more like historical, like put you in the moment as if you were there. Then I need to hire a black man to play Martin Luther King Jr. And there's nothing unethical about making casting decisions of who I'm going to hire and pay to play that role um, that way. There isn't a problem with that. So that that this is not um, a major argument on Henger's part, but it's just to kind of deal with this this idea that there's just something inherently 
and intrinsically wrong with discrimination. And that's just not true, he says. Okay, let's do one more of these and then and then maybe it's a good time to take a break. I feel like I'm talking a mile a minute and I'm feeling lightheaded. How are we doing in the chat? Has are, are things, any questions popping up there? Cool. Feel free to jump in. I mean, there's, there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Yeah. I like this topic a lot too. So this next argument we can do kind of quickly. So I mentioned a little bit about the setup for this with um, morally arbitrary irrelevant characteristics like um, let's say I'm hiring plumber. Oh man, yeah. I'm hiring plumbers like I don't need to hire beautiful people or what society generally considers as beautiful people for that job. If I did so, that might be a problem. Um, that I'm not uh, using relevant uh, variables for figuring out how to hire someone. And the concern in this argument is that um, race and sex would be in that same category. They're not relevant to hiring decisions. They're not relevant. They're they're arbitrary when we're thinking about job qualifications. Just the same way as maybe like uh, let's say I'm I've got a bunch of applicants in a room waiting to to have interviews for a job, and I go out there and I'm like, who here's a Cubs fan? You you cool. Come in. Everyone else can leave. Right? If I'm only hiring people based on whether they like the sports team that I like. That seems to be unethical. That wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be appropriate to make hiring decisions that way. Maybe race and sex are like that. Um, and Hedinger has a very quick argument for this. And it's just this, he, he says uh, there are the counterexamples we just talked about for the last argument. That shows that discrimination uh, on those variables can be very relevant. Now, that's not going to help him with affirmative action, though. But he's got a really quick argument to offer here that just says, hey, look, this isn't arbitrary. There's a purpose here. Um, we're trying to fix issues of social injustice and race and sex, hi using those as hiring uh, variables as things to discriminate on for making a decision about hiring is not arbitrary. It's going to serve to that purpose. Um, so now that purpose I say here needs to be defended, of course, but that, that can be done. That can be done. And there's plenty of arguments for that. Um, the idea that we want to do something about inequality in society is not an arbitrary whim or preference. Um, this isn't just like, oh, I, I just like diversity. I just like having diverse people around me in the workplace. There's something more serious going on here um, that has to do with justice and treating people with justice in society, uh, having an equal society, an egalitarian society, a society in which there is equal opportunity. That's the main goal. So I think Hedinger is able to deal with that one pretty quickly. Now this next category of objections is um, more serious. Uh, the worry about stereotyping is getting a little closer to home. And then this, uh, this is a big one that we're going to spend a bunch of time on, that somehow failing to hire the most qualified person is unjust in and of itself. We're going to have to cash that out. There's a lot of different options for how that argument could look. And Hedinger is going to give a really systematic approach for that. But I think this might be a good time for a little break, so I'm going to put the pause on the video, and um, I'll be back in a few minutes. Anyone in the chat got any questions here before the break? I thought I saw you typing something. I think, Hung Mei, you were typing something, and then you weren't typing something. No? Oh, okay. Or Li Ling, maybe? I, I can't remember. I saw a little notification in the chat while I was talking. Um, but yeah, I'll pause the video here and uh, then we'll come back and, and finish this up. All right, we're back. So getting into the next argument here, reverse discrimination is unjustified stereotyping. Um, the concern with this objection is about treating individuals based on class characteristics. And I, I think a little turn of phrase that kind of captures the intuition that's going on here is something like, it's, it's wrong, it's unethical to treat people like statistics. No one likes to be uh, treated as if uh, in a stereotypical sort of way, that people make assumptions about you um, or refuse to see you as the individual that you are and instead make judgments and treat you in a way that's based on these sort of generalized patterns that, of stereotypes, um, especially when those are the basis for making judgments or decisions that affect that person as an individual. 
And Hedinger's got a very, very interesting response to this. And I think this is one of his main reasons for why he does what I was talking about at the beginning of the lecture, where he wants to try to justify affirmative action not on a backwards-looking sort of compensatory justice or, or like a, a retro... Um, a reparations sort of way that this isn't a handout to kind of make up for past injustice or something like that but instead that he justifies reverse discrimination affirmative action on grounds of this kind of forward-looking objective of like this is a means whereby we create a more equal and just society and that's why it's the right thing to do and the way in which he this is relevant for his response to this objection is that it gives him the grounds theoretically argumentatively to be able to say that when you're hiring a person because they come from one of these disenfranchised demographics you're not hiring them based on a stereotype you're hiring them based on the way in which those qualities are things they have as an individual which enables them to serve this function better so let me give you a, a kind of a quick analogous um, example of this um, I become aware of some research that's been done um, a lot of it has been in just like the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years, um, but there's been a lot of stuff that's happened more recently um, to show that there's a, a a very clear statistical correlation with student success in education and whether they have instructors that look like them. Um, and that's not the most rational thing in the world. Like uh, this is um, you know connected with a lot of things that we might rightfully call psychological biases. Um, the, there's a lot of the uh, uh, research that's been done has just been kind of like pure statistical analytics to show that there's like a correlation between these variables but there have been some attempts to try to hypothesize what is responsible for that and some of those hypotheses that I've seen are things like um, that uh, if someone looks like you then it's a little easier to believe that you can do it too as opposed to, like that you can get to where that person was right that you can learn this stuff you can master this material because hey look your teacher did it and they're like you they come from the same kind of background whatever way in which an identity formation is capable of being made so it might not even be like the looking like you sort of thing like um, personally I've actually found and and also that the these sorts of commonalities um, maybe enable better rapport uh, or engagement with the student that then those things lead to more success but they can just have more confidence all, all around um, and that confidence is a pretty big deal for motivating and um, and not being encumbered or disempowered um, by doubt and things like that um, and I've actually noticed this a little bit myself very small um, sort of anecdotal observation I guess I could say Oh. Pardon me. Thank you. <laughs> I tried to keep the microphone away. Um, so I, you might have remembered in the very early part of the quarter, I was kind of introducing myself, and I, I mentioned that I identify about equal parts Lutheran and Buddhist. And the fact that I'm a philosopher who has religious commitments, I've seen students who are like, I didn't think that philosophy was something that I could do or be a part of. I, I thought that philosophy was really secular and didn't make room for people with religious ideas or that religiously in, informed philosophies were like considered irrational or relevant or disregarded or something like that. But they're like, hey, you're doing it and you're religious and you know you you like own up to that and and happily say that the, it has influenced your perspectives and things like that. And that's been encouraging to them. So I, because of the things that are true about me, maybe I can be, um, not that I, I can't be inspiring to somebody who doesn't share those characteristics with me, but that might there might be an increased effect for that. So I've got some personal experiences which makes me think, yeah, this, the fact that the statistics and research work out this way is not a surprise to me. But that also means that I'm um, being a white male. I There's some things that I can't do. There's some abilities that if the part of uh, like making a hiring decision for a teacher is to have someone who's going to enable student success, like that's the whole point of school, then that might be a relevant characteristic. 
um, for how hiring might happen. Now, in that context, there isn't something like social justice and making a more equal society. That wouldn't be an affirmative action sort of thing. That just might be a part of the job qualifications. But the point here is that even though those things are class characteristics, they're also features of me or somebody else, some other applicant, some other teacher, as an individual that allows our individual work to be more or less effective. And that's how Hedinger is thinking about it in the context of affirmative action with these goals of social justice. That someone who doesn't come from those disenfranchised demographics, hiring them isn't going to make any progress on those issues. They lack the qualifications to be able to fulfill a purpose of, so, of advancing social justice in a progressive way in our society. That's how Hedinger's thinking about it. So he's like, this isn't a matter of stereotypes. Now, if it was a compensatory sort of thing, if, this, if the motive was compensatory justice, then this would be maybe a problem. Um, one of the things that has been argued, uh, in, and you'll see Pojman kind of make this argument, he, he, I think he drops it really quickly in the middle of his article, but um, there's been a case made that Affirmative action has mostly helped uh, people who are coming from affluent backgrounds. So like middle upper class blacks or women or things like that. And that it hasn't helped so much on the lower class. Now, a lot of that might just be able to be solved by thinking about affirmative action policies as also targeting class issues and not just race and sex. And, and we'd want to open this up to other things already anyway. Um, so that might solve some of those problems. Many students that I've taught in the past have like, when they get the paper, they're like, I think we should be also pretty concerned with class. Like a lot of the race and sex issues of injustice end up being like manifested through class issues. And I think uh, classism is another part of the way in which our society is unequal and unjust. But um, even with that sort of off to one side, if this was a matter of making up for past injustices, then you know, the, stereo the, the general patterns here, the generalizations, don't work without exception. You can pull uh, a white male who's like doesn't have a lot of social advantages or social privileges at all and compare them against um, an affluent um, black female who's got all the opportunities in the world. So those aren't always going to match up that way. And this kind of redistribution of opportunity isn't going to necessarily create that kind of equality. But Hedinger's not p making that kind of move in trying to defend affirmative action. He's thinking that um, the way in which giving this job to someone from this is not a handout. It's actually kind of like saddling them with the kind of responsibility that they end up being this kind of um, ambassador or this kind of role model or example uh, that breaks down stereotypes. I don't know if you've had these kind of experiences in your own life, um, but... I can attest to this, and um, and I've seen many other cases secondhand in my life with people I've known that works this way too, that stereotypes are much easier to hang on to or to retain when you're not actually confronted with the people that you're stereotyping. But if you have to see them every day and work with them, now there's opportunities for those things to be busted up. Um, it's very easy to make these big generalized statements of what people can and cannot do or how effective they are, these general characteristics or something like that until you actually meet them, until you actually work with them, um, and, uh, and sort of they have the opportunity to, to sort of reject those stereotypes. That's a big part. I think um, Hedinger also has in the back of his mind this idea of role models that inspire other people to be like, yeah, I am going to work to try to make this happen. Like, I can have this ambition. This is something that is possible. There is room for this. There is room for me in this field or in this job, in this profession. Um, and that kind of encouragement and inspiration also works toward me making a more equal opportunity sort of society in the future. So um, I think he's got a good a good response here. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter what I think, but he's got a, a compelling case to make, whether you ultimately agree or disagree. And his strategy here is to say, look, we're not using stereotypes here. Stereotypes have nothing to do with it. The fact that they are in this demographic gives them a qualification as an individual just in and of itself. It's not the basis for making some further judgment or something like that. Okay. Um, all right. Now, here is a real big section of the paper. Real big one. Um, okay. Oh, I, I just got freaked out for a second. Everyone, uh, chat, you can hear me, right? I'm connected. 
Internet's working? Okay, good. Okay, I just, I saw a little red thing down in the notifications. I was worried I wasn't connected. All right, good, good, good. Still, I'm still a little uh, paranoid after all the problems we've had with tech issues in the past. Okay, so this next section is a pretty, it's a, it's a doozy. And I think this is another really, really good example um, of uh, something to, like, use when you're thinking about working on your own paper. Um, a lot of times I've worked with students on papers and they've been like, um, I don't know what else to say. I mean, the situation, I see the controversy, there's different sides, but man, doesn't this point just solve it? And sometimes um, what can be overlooked is how the same kind of judgment could be argued for on very different grounds. That like when we've talked about this before uh, with a number of the topics we've had in the quarter so far, like if there's a fiduciary duty to stockholders, what's the moral basis of that? There's a lot of different options. Boatwright tried to walk us through a bunch of options here. Hedinger's doing the same thing with this idea that failing to hire, this objection that says failing to hire the most qualified person is itself unjust. On what basis is the next question? And Hedinger's going to try out a bunch of different options and then try to give a response to each one of them. Um, many times when we're dealing with evaluating some kind of moral issue or controversy, we might want to be sensitive to morally relevant features, um, that there might be a lot of them that are competing, kind of like the Star Trek example I was talking about earlier in the lecture. Um, and this might be something that someone has a moral intuition about, about affirmative action. They're like, this is a morally relevant feature. Affirmative action, strong affirmative action, means not hiring the most qualified person. That feels wrong. It feels unfair. Maybe something like that. But there's uh, there's a need to kind of cash that out. Uh, if that's going to be a morally relevant feature, on what grounds does it get its moral relevance? And that can be a place of deep disagreement. And so Hedinger can't just deal with one version of this argument. He needs to try to deal with all the different versions. Um, and I think he's attempting to be exhaustive here. If you can think of another way to ground or back up this idea of failing to hire the most qualified person is unjust. I'd love to hear about it. Um, I'll build it into my lectures in the future for sure. So far that hasn't happened yet, but maybe you'll think of something. So let's look at all the different ways that this could be cashed out and see what Hedinger's responses are. First one is a concern about efficiency. And you might have been anticipating this all the way back to when I was um, talking about the difference between weak and strong affirmative action. Um, so if strong affirmative action is saying, you're going to hire a less qualified employee as opposed to the more qualified employee. You could start to imagine like uh, how much, you know, how, how big of a dip are we making here? I definitely think that it, uh, it would be a total misunderstanding of Hedinger's position to say that what he's advocating for is hiring people who are totally unqualified for jobs just because they come from one of these disenfranchised demographics. That is not the proposal. And probably, once the difference here dips far enough down, Hedinger might think that that's a problem. He definitely thinks that there, that efficiency in some versions of it could start to become morally problematic, but there are some basic ways in which he thinks, no, this isn't morally problematic at all. But that difference in qualification is going to mean a loss of efficiency, potentially. That's one of the consequences of it. So reverse discrimination is not the most efficient procedure for hiring. If you're trying to maximize profits, hiring less qualified employees, probably not going to get the job done, right? So there's going to be a cost there in terms of efficiency. Hedger's reply is that, yeah, there's a cost. That doesn't mean it's unjust. People do inefficient things all the time, like his grocery bag example, and we don't think that there's been some deep moral injustice that's happened. The person who's like trying to you know, carry all the groceries in one bag instead of just using two, that would be better. We might be like, they're kind of a dummy, but uh, they haven't done something unjust, right? And we'd probably say that they're a dummy if there's no good reason for that inefficiency. But again, affirmative action is not in a situation of saying there's no good reason. The good reason is working for social justice, <laughs> and that's a good reason. Um, so uh, he also adds to this that efficiency and profit, which is usually what we're concerned about, isn't the only goal or duty for business. Um, and that's why he's opposed to cashing this out in terms of a violation of fiduciary responsibility too. I told you the fiduciary duty debate would come back in every discussion we have. Here it is again. Um, so that's kind of a big potential deal breaker. He's not going to try to solve the whole fiduciary duty debate in this paper. 
um, but this is where it would get plugged in. Uh, if there are no social responsibilities of businesses, then they don't have social responsibilities for trying to promote equality and egalitarianism too. But if they do, that seems like a pretty important social responsibility, a big social value, social justice. Okay, now here's where things get a little interesting. Maybe this loss in efficiency is going to involve an unjust treatment of other people. And this patients at a hospital example is just perfect, primo, for capturing that intuition. If I'm on the hiring staff for, I'm in HR for, for the hospital, I think to myself, the hospital has a moral and ethical mandate. We have a responsibility, we have a duty to our patients to provide the best quality care we can. If we hire a less qualified doctor, that might mean not giving patients the best quality care possible. And so we'd be in violation of that duty if we use an affirmative action hiring policy. Okay, that's where the problem would come from. And I think Hedinger is somewhat sympathetic to this. He says, maybe. But even, even with the fiduciary duty sort of thing, even in that case, the problem with that cannot be explained as an injustice that's done to the person who fails to get hired. It's not unfair to them. And that's a very interesting way for him to frame this debate. That if, if you want to be concerned about efficiency, sure, okay. If you want to be concerned about the patients or the consumers or something like that, that's fine. But you cannot use that as an excuse or as a way of trying to rationalize a concern for the person who's getting passed over for employment by the by the hiring the affirmative action hiring policy. So that's that's what he's going to say about that. So I do think actually a one sort of version of this concern is actually something that Hedinger would put in his second category of objections, things that have some weight to them. Um, but uh, as one of my students pointed out this afternoon, in many cases, like maybe this hospital case is a fringe case, it's an, ex an exception case. With a lot of jobs, that difference in qualification may not really be significant for the job. There's plenty of jobs that don't require maximum qualifications or that you're getting more bang for your buck by hiring the more qualified employee. So in those situations, efficiency just wouldn't even be on the table as a concern at all. Like anyone can flip burgers at McDonald's or something, right? That's not something where it would be like, oh, wait, this person had a master's degree, so we've got to hire them or something like that, depending on the job, right? Okay, um, next concern. The most qualified person has a right to the job. Now, first thing we should say about cashing out this is that if we, want, if we talk about rights, we're talking about actually a pretty robust and technical moral concept here, theoretically. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a term of technical art in a moral theory to say something is a right. If someone has a right for something, then that logically entails that everyone else has an obligation, a moral obligation toward that person with respect to that right. So, for example, if I have a right to life, everyone has an obligation to not kill me, um, unless in self-defense or some. maybe there's some exceptions to that. But other people get put under obligations as soon as we confer to me a certain type of right, um, basically to not interfere with that right. So basically saying that the most qualified person has a right to the job entails that everyone else has an obligation, a moral obligation, to hire that person for that job, to give them that job. And Henger's just like, I can't see any way in which you can argue for this. What would be the moral basis for assigning that right? Rights don't come out of thin air. They need an argument just like any other moral claim. How could you defend that? What moral values could you use to say the most qualified person has this moral right to their employment? And he's just like, I just can't, I can't see how this would work. And there's tons of intuitive counterexamples for it. His painter example is a very, very compelling image to me, at least. Is if I've, if I've got, uh, let's say I live in a small town, um, I've got a fence that needs painting, and there's a professional painter. This is what he does for a living that lives in the town, and uh, he would definitely be the most efficient choice. Uh, he's the most qualified person to paint my fence, but I decide to give the job to my cousin, who's uh, you know on summer break from college and needs some spending money. And he's not going to do as good of a job, but I like I'll, I'll hire him. Um, if the professional painter is walking down the street in our town and sees my cousin painting my fence, he can't like knock on my door and be like, "Dude, you morally wronged me by giving that job to your cousin. 
because I'm more qualified to do that. I would do a better job of it than him. What what what's your moral problem here? You can't accuse me of a kind of injustice. Like that's not that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, if there is going to be some sort of concern, like I, I had a student this afternoon who was like, well, that seems to make sense in that case with, um, you know, a small town, you know, just a personal job sort of thing. It's like, it's my fence. I can decide who I want to hire for it. Um, but this wouldn't be true maybe at the level of managers of corporations and things like that. They can't just hire whoever they want for the jobs, right? Don't they have an obligation to hire the most qualified person? If they do, if there is some sort of disanalogy there, that obligation is not going to come down to the fact that the most qualified person has a right to the job. It's, again, not going to be about the most qualified person. It might be something more like fiduciary duty to stockholders, right? That that manager needs to run the business with an eye toward that kind of efficiency. Maybe something like that would be the justification for it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's so much for that concern. Is this making sense in the chat? How are you guys doing? Doing good? Wonderful. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Oh, man, it's getting late. I am running out of gas. <laughs> we got a lot more to get through, too. I might cut this lecture off early. Thursdays are real brutal for me. Uh, it's just a nonstop. I'm like 13 hours straight, basically, on, on Thursdays. Um, I might call an audible here. But let's let's get through this section at the very least. Okay, concern three. And notice how similar these are. Like, I, commonly, we have a tendency to run together all these different moral concepts of having a right to something, deserving it, um, entitled to it. We use that language kind of interchangeably in a sort of sloppy way a lot of times informally in conversation. But I think Hedinger is right here that this, this isn't just hair splitting. The, there are significant differences of moral appeal that are going on with these different forms of the argument. So what do we have in mind here morally when we're talking about how the most qualified person deserves the job? Well, this is connecting with intuitions about merit meritocracy. That basically people should be treated based on their merit. And think back to Aristotle for this. If we want to say someone is praiseworthy, someone you daimon. Aristotle built into his definition of this the kind of thing about not just doing the excellent thing, but doing it intentionally, doing it knowingly, um, with awareness that this is the excellent thing to do, where it's more about what I'm contributing to making that excellent thing happen, rather than some kind of case of, I just luckily happen to do the right thing. That, in that case, we're going to praise more the world <laughs> for making favorable circumstances for this excellent thing to happen, luck, maybe, um, but not the person. But if the person is, is doing that under their own power, then it would be like, props, kudos to you for the work that you did. You earned that praise, right? You, de you deserve that praise because of the merit that you express through what you can own, right? Your contribution to this situation. And Aristotle was, uh, you know, he wanted to emphasize how it can't be about everything. The world has to contribute something. But the less the world is contributing, the more praiseworthy. And that's this kind of basic idea of a meritocracy. And I, just as a quick caveat getting into this argument, I think in, in my understanding of American culture, my experience and exposure to it, meritocratic moral intuitions go really deep in our culture. The idea, like uh, I hear a lot, respect has to be earned. The idea of earning something or that you should be treated based on your contributions, right? Um, think, uh, I, 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 man, maybe I don't want to bring up Trump. Um, a lot of people, uh, Trump included, have been talking about like immigration policies as like, we're not just going to hand out citizenship to people wherever, but they, we want them to be contributing to society. They want to, be, they, we want them to be like helping to make America better. And then they're going to be given these sorts of, privileges of being a U.S. citizen. I mean, that kind of thing, that people should be rewarded for the good things that they put in, and they should be punished for the things that when they don't do that, or if they're putting in bad stuff, right? That's part of, like, meritocratic systems. And a lot of American business happens on a meritocratic basis, but we think about that merit in terms of qualifications, so that a person who is more qualified deserves a job out of merit, right? 
So we're going to treat people based on what they're contributing, right? Hedinger has a very interesting reply to this. Um, he says, most of our qualifications we don't actually deserve. Or at least there are significant components to why we have the qualifications that we do that we cannot claim any credit for, that are really matters of luck. They're matters of circumstance, not about us and what we contribute to the situation. Um, so uh, he has a whole list here of like, where do our qualifications come from? What influences them? Things like innate abilities, including genetics, home environment, like how you were raised, socioeconomic class of parents, quality of schools attended, luck, um, and effort or perseverance. Those are all factors, those are all variables that contribute to what qualifications that you have. Um, I like to add a bunch of other things here, like what does luck mean? Um, something might include like, did you have a traumatic experience happen to you as a child? I mean, deep trauma can have a psychological impact on you that makes it a lot harder to be qualified for certain types of jobs, to be able to do certain um, jobs, uh, certain tasks effectively might be a lot harder if you're struggling with something like the, the psychological aftershocks of deep trauma. Um, if you ha were raised in uh, a less stable home, you might have this kind of like baseline that the world is untrustworthy, that it's uh, something to be feared, that the other shoe can drop at any time, that even if things are looking good, something bad might be right around the corner versus someone who is raised in a very stable home environment um, and looks at the world in a way that is just full of opportunities of goodness. And yeah, there's some scary things out there, but you know, th that's, not the, that's not the baseline kind of psychological attitude of approaching any novel situation. I identify in the latter category deeply. And we can talk about a lot of these things as sort of under this rubric of privilege. Um, Privilege can can include things out of the product of like injustices of the past, like how society is structured and giving out these benefits and burdens in unequal amounts. But they also can just be like naturally occurring, and it's it's just a matter of luck. It's not anyone did anything wrong. Why you have the genetics that you do, or why you were born into this family as opposed to this family to have this race versus that race, stuff like that. Um, some of these things are are not anyone's fault. Um, but they still affect qualifications. So I can't take credit for this stuff. Um, when I think about my own privilege, and I think about my privilege a lot, I think it's important to be aware of these things. And it's very easy for privilege to be something invisible. I don't know how many of you have uh, taken some sociology classes or think about social justice a lot, but that's a kind of a very common thing that sociologists have been telling us for a long time. That's one of their main kind of uh, sort of the products of their research is that People who enjoy privileges don't recognize it. They are things that are sort of invisible. Because imagine it. I mean, any person who's alive, whether they have privileges or not, is like thinking about like, what can I do? How can I like improve myself? How can I develop myself? I want to go to school. I want to get an education. I want to develop my resume. I want to learn these skills, all that kind of stuff. And and what your attention really gets focused on is all the effort that you're putting into it, all the things that you are doing, right? There's a kind of, uh, I wouldn't say self-centeredness, but just a preoccupation with the self that draws a lot of attention. And you're like, I did that. I was involved in that. I, I pulled myself up from my bootstraps, stuff like that. But all the factors that are circumstantial that are contributing to you being successful are sort of invisible to you. There actually is some asymmetry here. If you're like in a disenfranchised demographic or you don't enjoy those privileges, they become painfully obvious to you. Um, that is definitely a pattern that the sociological research has um, evoked. And you might even feel this personally. You might be like, yep, yep. When things are unequal in that sort of way, when you see that some people in society gain these sorts of advantages uh, and you don't, you run up against those barriers. That's why we call it a glass ceiling, if you've heard that phrase before, um, that you can see through it. But um, that doesn't mean that it uh, that it, you don't run up against it and hit those barriers and can't go further. And you're like, why am I not going further? I've got all these qualifications, all this sort of stuff. But there are these blocks, right? Okay, so in my own case, with, with the privileges that I enjoy, um, I've actually in the last few years sort of come to recognize that this thing about like a stable 
uh, home and, and like um, this sort of baseline attitude about approaching life that I'm like just really like open about it and like happy to engage and I'm not afraid of risks very much. Um, I'm going to get into a jump, uh, jump into a conversation with just about anybody. Um, I'm not afraid of what they might say or do to me, that that actually is probably one of the biggest privileges that I enjoy as a person in this world. Uh, it's very empowering and very freeing and lets me jump into things that other people might not. Um, and it's been uh, eye-opening to sort of think about that and get to know some people where that's not that case. They don't have that kind of baseline and they struggle with that stuff on a daily basis. I have some very close people in my life that are in that category. Um, and these privileges, I sometimes the word privilege is loaded for some people when I have conversations like, I don't like that word. Privileges are not essentially wrong or evil. How they, uh, How people get them could be a problem or what we do in response to people who have them could also be a problem too. Um, and that's kind of what uh, Hedinger is trying to make the point out about here. If you want to say that the most qualified person deserves the job on a kind of meritocratic basis, the only thing that you can say you're deserving of is based on your effort and perseverance. All of these other factors here that are on that list, innate abilities, home environment, socioeconomic class of parents, quality of schools, luck, things I'm talking about, these like baseline attitudes based on your childhood or how you were raised. Um, those are not things that you can take credit for. You didn't make them happen. They just happened to you. So <laughs> Edinger kind of flips the tables on this argument in a very dramatic fashion. He says, if being deserving really only depends on effort, much of the time, not always, but there's definitely a pattern here, People that come from disadvantaged demographics and backgrounds, less privileged backgrounds, are usually more deserving of the job than the more qualified applicant because they've had to do a lot more. They've had to put a lot more effort in to just get to the level of qualifications that they're at. Um, they're fighting against that kind of asymmetry of advantage that people with privilege have. Um, so, but he does say he doesn't want to make this the argument in favor of, of affirmative action. In other words, Hedinger doesn't want to endorse a meritocratic moral standard for how we should make hiring decisions. He's not trying to argue for that. He's just responding to the argument of his opponents here. If his opponents want to drop the meritocratic card, he's like, yeah, that's not going to work. Not for the conclusion you're trying to justify with it. Um, you can't say the most qualified person deserves the job. Um, as if the presence of their qualifications is the indicator, the clear indicator of how much effort or contribution they've made to themselves in making themselves a competitive candidate for the job. That's Hedinger's main point, just diffusing, debunking this argument that his opponents use. This is kind of a tricky one. Chat, did that all make sense? I just want to kind of check in and see if my description uh, did a good job there. Cool. Any questions about it? <laughs> Anything you're not quite sure about, Tanya? Or you just want to confirm about? Okay. All right. That's fair. You can ask later. That'd be okay. Yeah, I hear you. I'm going to wrap this one up pretty quick tonight. <laughs> Half asleep. Yeah. Okay, let's just do uh, let's do these last two, and I'll I'll talk about these other ones uh, next week in my next lecture. Um, okay, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So the last way we might say that it'd be unjust to not hire the most qualified person is to say that they're entitled to the job, and we mean entitlement as something different than the other moral considerations in this way. Um, we mean a natural and legitimate expectation based on a kind of social promise. So the argument here is that, um, that, take this kind of image, society has been preaching a kind of message to you since you were young, going into school, that if you work hard and you develop yourself, get good grades, you know, get good qualifications, get good experience, internships, et cetera, et cetera, you build out that resume, uh, if you can make yourself into the most qualified applicant, you're going to get the job. That's how the game is played. Those are the rules of the game. And then if you did all that work and you got yourself to that position with all that investment that you put in there, 
maybe all the stuff that you're contributing you can take credit for, all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, you get to applying to jobs, and they're like, sorry, you're the most qualified applicant, but we didn't give you the job because we had to give it to this disenfranchised demographic person for affirmative action policies. And that's like a big like, what? You're like, they got sideswiped. The promise was broken, and that's unjust. That's the kind of the intuitive logic behind this objection, I think. Um, so reverse discrimination frustrates this expectation that society has been encouraging in people. Um, and sometimes people try to give this some legal teeth by saying that it violates a legal precedent from this Title VII of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964, which is where we got this law that said, yeah, you can't make hiring discrimination on the basis of race or sex. That was like, boom, right there in the law. Now, Supreme Court has ruled on this and does not, and like I was saying, the most recent ruling is specifically about the Civil Rights Act, uh, the one from, uh, from 2016. Um, and this, that they've ruled basically that under these conditions, affirmative, certain conditions they specify, affirmative action is not in violation of Title VII. So the first argument Hedinger is saying is that, look, uh, this isn't a surprise. You can't, you can't start saying like there's been some bait and switch here because we've had affirmative action on the table for 50 years. This isn't anything new. Um, and there's been rulings about it. So the rules, if we're thinking about social rules in terms of the law, that's all out there and transparent. That's one argument he gives. The second argument you could see is sort of maybe being couched like this. Okay, well, maybe some people don't know about the law. They don't research this. If they're not lawyers, how are they supposed to know about that? What about the culture of society encouraging that expectation? It does seem to resonate a little bit, right? You get these kinds of messages like improve yourself, get good grades, you know, get, you know, all this stuff. Um, but Henger's second response addresses that more directly, and he says, that picture is just naive about how society functions. Um, most of those in p positions, like elevated positions of all sorts, whether that's like a high-paying job or a prestigious job or something like that, don't have those positions solely on the basis of their qualifications. There's all sorts of other reasons why people get hired for things. It's not always the most qualified applicant getting the job. Um, I don't know that much about the business world. I've said that before in terms of personal experience. I've gotten a lot of stuff through reading and talking with people, especially talking to my students who are in the world of business. And the thing that students have been reporting to me more and more frequently in the last few years is that the business world is increasingly run not on the basis of like what school you went to or your past experience or just kidding out your resume, but just mostly based on networking, making personal connections with people. That's how you get a job. That's the rules of the game, and that's increasingly becoming more of the kind of social expectation and standard. Um, so in that way, Hedinger is trying to undermine the idea that there is this natural and legitimate expectation based on a kind of social promise. It's just like, no, that's not how things work. That's not how the business world works. So there's no basis for thinking that this promise has been made to you. You can't like work in your little room, doing all your studies and everything, and then just bring your resume in and be like, you gotta hire me now. There's a lot more going on here. People make decisions for all sorts of reasons that aren't, not, and that aren't always in terms of the quality of their resume and their, and their uh, qualifications. Okay, so they're not the most entitled to the job either. Okay, let's do one more. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's his exhaustive account of trying to track down objections that come from this area of trying to say that there's something unjust that's happened um, by failing to hire the most qualified person. Okay, the last specious objection that Hedinger addresses is this idea that it, affirmative action undermines equal opportunity for white males. And I think Hedinger puts this in here not because um, this is a very compelling argument or this is a serious thing he has to deal with from his opponents, but mostly just because of how frequently you hear people say things like, um, we're, we're, we're out of the woods. Things are equal now. We have an equal society. Um, we have laws that protect against discrimination. We have the 13th Amendment. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Like, this isn't the America of slavery. Um, this isn't the America of women not having the right to vote. We solved these problems. And so affirmative action is undermining this equal opportunity situation that we have. I mean, this, ob this objection usually comes on disputing a descriptive claim about the state of our world. Basically that we aren't dealing with inequality in society anymore. 
And I think that statement is just false. Like that view of the situation is just factually inaccurate. Um, and that's what Hedinger is saying when he's saying white males don't have equal opportunity. They have a greater than equal opportunity. We haven't solved all these sorts of problems. If I was going to, I, you might have noticed how in setting up this debate and in these readings, we didn't do something like go through the long laundry list of facts and statistics and patterns that demonstrate how our society is still very unequal and not egalitarian. And there's a lot of stuff to do there. I didn't walk through that because this is focusing mostly on the moral stuff. I mean, you can kind of imagine like we don't, let's say you've got some fictional society and you don't know whether they're out of the woods yet or not out of the woods. We could still talk about whether if they weren't out of the woods, would affirmative action be morally justified? If it would help promote social justice, would it be the right way to go about that? You can just kind of treat it theoretically. But stepping away from theory and into reality, I think it's wrong to just say that this would just be a theoretical argument because we're not actually in an unjust, unequal society. That's just not true. Um, one way I might try to give just a quick argument here to, to reinforce this is the idea that changing things like the legal rules of the game does not change all the situations from which people are actually living their lives. I mentioned earlier about this kind of example of um, some like your grandparents doing something uneth unethical in the past but legal and making a bunch of money off of it and then you inheriting it and that kind of thing. I mean, people are not operating from equal starting points. Um, there still are a lot of ways in, in which resources and opportunities and uh, these social benefits are unequally distributed and burdens are unequally distributed too. Um, those are realities that we face. And just we can't just legislate away racism or sexism or any of these other patterns of inequality. Um, there are lingering conditions that are part of a legacy of that past injustice. And something like affirmative action doesn't need to be seen as making up for that stuff as if we don't have those problems today. We still have those problems today. We're still struggling against that. Um, and there are, and I think it would just even be false to say that the only thing that we're experiencing right now is aftershocks of things in the past. Um, there are a lot of things I could point to as current and active ways in which inequality is supported and reinforced rather than, um, than that we're just dealing with past stuff. Just, just this one thing alone. Take the um, housing crisis and financial collapse of 2008. Uh, there was a lot of predatory lending happening, and a lot of it was on racial lines. That's that's a big problem right there, just all on its own. That's a recent thing. That is like contemporary, and that's still happening. So, um, and there's just an untold number of these things. So I, there's not a lot of basis, uh, in fact, for this kind of objection. Um, you want to talk about that more? I'd be happy to. <laughs> Um, but again, Hedinger, uh, he definitely thinks that the situation is that white males and other privileged groups have a greater than equal opportunity, and so that's still a problem. And that <clears throat> this isn't just a matter of making up for past injustices. This isn't um, a reparation sort of thing. It's about building an actual equal opportunity future. And that we have to put our money where, it's, where our mouths are. We have to take active action to set that up, not just make the laws that make uh, discrimination illegal, and then just let it slowly turn into that. Um, we need to speed that up a little bit. And that's been a lot of the rhetoric that's been involved in the past, a lot of the kind of ways of talking about the justification of affirmative action when people were advocating it and setting precedents for it in the government and in businesses and in schools in the, in the, in the legacy of the last 50 years of affirmative action policies. That's been sort of the idea that we can't just wait for things to kind of settle into a state of equal opportunity. We got to push it along. We got to push that progressive progress. Okay, I think I'm going to call the video uh, off here. I'm just ready to fall apart. <laughs> I'm happy we were able to get this far. We got two more arguments to talk about, but I think we can do that in Pojman for next time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to call an audible and, and call it quits. Um, and boy, what should we do for a code? Let's do a code word. Um, um yeah sleepy me too totally um okay how about this um neurobiology
There we go. This is a book my partner's reading. Neurobiology is the code. Um. Oh shoot, it's mirrored. Neurobiology. Um. How about just biology? If you just put biology down, that'll be fine. Um, neurobiology sounds like a fancy word, but I would take biology either. That's fine. It doesn't much matter. It's an arbitrary characteristic, the code word. It'll perform its function. Okay. See you around, everyone. We'll finish this up uh, next week. And keep those uh, comments and, and questions coming for your paper topics. Uh, stay in contact with me. I really want to help you out with that. Sooner is better than later, uh, just to get the wheels turning and get some direction on it. Okay. Until next time.